for trading and answering quick. Yeah. Hey, good morning, guys. Ken at Tortoise Capital. This is the Creativity 202 uh, check-in for uh, October 15th, 2023. I want to welcome Mark as our guest today. Just quick, I'm going to try a one-minute introduction. So, Creativity 202, the course, is the intersection of three bodies of knowledge. The Creativity Story Science of Angus Fletcher, and we are using the Handbook of Creativity for Army Leaders that he wrote for me to use with the Army at our college to drive a set of 30 lessons that will reliably increase our creative capacities because it activates those parts of our brain that evolved over millions of years to find new ways to respond to dangerous worlds and share those ideas through stories and inspiration. So there's a lot of evolutionary biology in our cognition, the way our brains form. Stories unleash that. That's the science that, and research that I do with him and that he does at Ohio State University as the director of the world's leading think tank on story science. Best-selling author, award-winning professor, amazing guy. Just got published one of our projects in Harvard Business Review with one of my students. He's just amazing. So that's one body of knowledge, Western story science. The second body of knowledge uh, is my technical trading techniques, which I have included my own write-up and an experiential learning exercise for each of those 30 lessons that Fletcher did with a military framework. I provide a experiential learning exercise with a trading experience that is fundamental to the way that we teach. Between those two sets of short experiential lessons, all these guys work their butt off each week to go through them, to reflect on it, to find the thing that resonated the most with them. Even if it was something that carried over from the previous week's discussion, so previous week's discussion, their own reflection, their own lived life, or the Fletcher experience, or my experience, one of those things is going to provide something amazing each week. And we want them to reflect on that and bring a short story about it to share in a true story circle here. So the first body of knowledge is Fletcher's story science. The second body of knowledge is my experiential learning about trading and adult learning theory. And the third body of knowledge comes from my mentor, Professor David Boji, who invented true storytelling as part of his expertise in the art of storytelling as seen through the eyes of indigenous cultures. He invented the world the discipline of organizational storytelling 40 years ago and is still by far the number one cited academic scholar in narrative inquiry, story sense making in the world. And it's my privilege to work with him. I'm writing a couple papers for him for our next annual quantum storytelling conference. And it's everything that you could imagine that it is from the name. So when we're in a true story circle, we come in with the intention of telling the best truth that we can about something significant to us at the emotional level in order to share that truth with others so that the people may thrive. And that while we're in that circle, we have created a safe space in which people can trust each other to live up to that intention and to tell the truth as best they can, as seen by the evidence of experiencing that, and that we are engaging not in judging each other, thinking hard about the story that they're telling, offering insights or wisdom of our own, processing that information. We are only there to 
empty our bowl and fully experience the truth of their story and let it sink deeply into our bones so that when we leave the story circle later and we re reflect on this over the coming week, something from that is going to emerge when it's time and in the right place that will help us understand more about our world. So we're engaging in non-judgmental deep listening. Guests are invited to participate in this ritualistic experience. Um, we invite you to introduce yourself and uh, we invite you to politely and deeply listen and and uh, we, we appreciate you having there as a witness to what it is that we're doing. We'll give you a chance later to comment when we ask everybody for the one word that bubbles up that summarizes whatever this experience means and we carry that we, we carry that word for the week with us into the week ahead and that becomes one of the things that we think about as we go through the experiential exercises from Fletcher and from me and from listening to each other's stories um, and that's in essence the three bodies of knowledge that come together for creativity 202 it runs on a structured process of that that ritual is what we do People take the course at their own pace, and whatever lesson they're working on is the lesson they report on. But there's no intention or requirement that everybody's on the same lesson. That's unmanageable. We just respect that everybody's doing their thing, and they're going to come and tell us an amazing story that was triggered by all of this other material. So it just sort of works out that way. And some of these guys that are in here that you see are have been here through... Uh, other cohorts and are just staying with it because it's so darn interesting. I attribute most of the transformational growth in my own life over the last four years to this process, whether it's in trading, in soccer, in my business, in my family, in my personal relationships, my personal growth, all of that, most of the transformational stuff that has occurred is a consequence of doing these true story circles and then combining it with this uh, particular course has been amazing uh, for me. Almost every big idea I've had in the last four years has come from exactly this process. So I'm a proponent. I'm a fan. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to invite Greg to check in. I'm going to go in the order that I see you. And this is just a chance for a 10-second check-in, who you are, where you're at, what's up? Greg. Uh, hi, I'm Greg. I'm currently based out of Austin, Texas in the United States. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm trading. I spend most of my time uh, lately doing trying to automate a lot of Ken's work. I do a ton of testing uh, within the last couple of days, and I've hit... Uh, almost peak frustration trying to make, make back-end things happen. But, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Joe? Uh, I was having some audio issues earlier. Am I clear now? You are good to go, sir. Like, okay. like stream water. <laughs> Joe Cryer down in St. Augustine Beach, Florida. And... Uh, I'd like to say I've been in the money business my entire life. My father was a fur trapper, and that was my first exposure to negotiated markets when we went to sell those furs. And uh, my entire life has been involved with this and observing human emotion in the markets. I'm happy to be on board with this, and I've had a little bit of a clearing that allows me to review what I've learned and hopefully learn and grow. Awesome. Negotiated markets. There's nothing better. Nothing more interesting. The, the full human experience and nature is on full display. You know, uh, Mark, welcome. Hi, guys. My name is Mark. Um, joining you from Lebanon and the Middle East. And um, I have a bachelor in uh, clinical psychology uh, with a minor in economics. 
and uh, it's been four years now uh, I've been researching and uh, I found uh, a community where I think where I can actually uh, strive and try to discover and explore if this is where I can continue or new. So I'm happy to be here and I uh, would love to listen to what you guys have to say. Well, our prayers for peace are with you. Yep. And doing whatever prayer can do to help. Exactly. Let's, let's hope that we can see the light. May, may may he have mercy on our souls. Chin Long, how are you? Very well, Ken. Um, yeah, my name is Chen Long Li. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm a Chinese Canadian or Canadian Chinese, whatever that means. Uh, have been in this course the third round. I really like it because I, you know, everybody talk about accountability. I feel Uncountable if I participate, or I participate because I feel accountable. Um, you know, if we look at the time frame in one year, um, that's one year is a winner, maybe three or five hour. That's how I feel about the cost. Uh, and Damien, bring us home. I'm I'm Damien. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Bienvenue, uh, Marc. I'm assuming that you speak French since you're Lebanon. I lived in Lebanon when I was a very young kid when my dad was uh, assigned there, and my grandfather li uh, lived in Lebanon too, by the way, around World War I. So, beautiful country, and nice to have you on board. Um, in regards to me, I've been Part of the creativity 202 since the beginning of this year i will be honest with the group i haven't really taken it seriously um so we're back at round two and this time we're going to be doing the work Aho. i i would just say that when you start digging a hole you know uh you can only dig one shovel full at a time you, you try to do more than that, it's you just get hurt and frustrated. So keep digging. You know, we're gonna get out of this. We're gonna get out of this hole by digging even harder. So uh, I spend time trying to figure out how to dig out of a hole. I think you can do it. I think you have to dig it broad enough that at some point you start taking the dirt from one wall and then start building a ramp. So as you expand the hole, you can actually place the dirt from each scoop in such a way that you can build a ramp to get out of the hole. So people that say you can't dig your way out of a hole, I uh, am not in agreement with that. Not in agreement with that. Uh, you know what? Since we have a, a planet that's brown, the deeper you dig, you, you come out mm -hmm. at the other end. So you're that's out a hard of the hole anyways. That's a hard sell. If if the imagination of geologists is to be trusted, that that presents all sorts of problems uh, once you get past the crust. I know, I know. I'm just teasing. I'm just yeah. speaking. It. Yeah. But that's the spirit, you know, whatever it takes. All right. So I'm going to hit the tones. This will now move us from the foyer where we engage in, uh, you know, pleasantries and whatnot. And... Uh, and we're going to head into the into the sacred circle of the true story circle. And again, in that one, we only tell our stories as truthfully as best we can so that the people may thrive. And we engage in deep listening. No processing, no judging, no commentary, no chat. Just you get to experience the sound of the truth in its in its best effort to be told the truth tries to speak through us and we're honoring that by doing our best to say it when it's our turn and to hear it when we're in its presence uh, in the long run you get to hear yourself doing your best to tell the truth and that is a very powerful feeling and 
history has shown that after three or four or five sessions of this, nothing else but the truth will do. And uh, it really becomes an addiction. Um, I, that's the only way I can describe it. So, so here we go into the circle. And we use the talking stick to have just one person talking at a time. Damien. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing um, what happened to me over the last two and a half months. And one of the aha moments that I had this week uh, two and a half months ago, I decided to start tracking every single trade uh, that I've been taking uh, with the entry price, exit price, the profit, the losses, and so on. And I've learned a lot of valuable lessons out of it. Um, one of the biggest lessons that, that I've learned is that my, my losses were too big. And it took me a long, a very long time to understand why I was having those losses. And about a week and a half ago, I ended up talking to Trader X. That was, I was introduced to him by Ken Long about three weeks ago. And him and I had a long talk uh, last Thursday. Not this Thursday, but the Thursday before, 10 days ago. And uh, he gave me a lot of good tips on what I should do. Uh, to be able to trade the way I want to trade. So um, he convinced me on putting together what I would call the Damien trading rules, um, something that I had a very hard time grasping over the last year, me being with Ken Long, because I could not understand how I could have trading rules when I did not know what to trade, when to trade, how to trade. And it took me a very long time to, to put a grasp around the other thing, the whole thing. Um, one of the things, and, and Ken is aware of it, and I, um, because I've, I have a very, very, very small account, uh, and I have to get around the, the PDD rule, which is the patent day trader rule, uh, which means that if I don't have $25,000, I can only trade, place three trades a week. Uh, so for that reason, to be able to go around that, I have to trade either options or futures. Futures, in my opinion, are too risky uh, and they require a lot of capital if you wanna do it the right way. So I exclusively trade spy options um and that is the reason why i i i had a talk with trader x because i found out that he does the same thing that i do so i figured that the two of us could uh, put our heads together and put a system in place uh that can help the two of us and who knows maybe in the future can help other traders also um so that is basically where I am right now on my journey. Uh, and from this point on, we're gonna be refining the trading rules, refining the system, uh, moving forward. I'm looking at this as a stepping stone in my learning. Uh, I'm starting also to realize that trading is a lot more difficult than I thought it was. Uh, I was treating the whole thing as being an amateur. I have to become a professional if I want to do this long term. Um, and it is a very good 
uh, learning experience that I had over the last year. Uh, now that the summer is over, I can start concentrating on my training career. And on this note, I hope. Joe. Hi, guys. Um, <clears throat> excellent week of work this week. And uh, this lesson two talks about planning and uh, resulting chaos that comes out of it and blows plans completely out of the water. And I did an awful lot of thinking about that this week. And the biggest aha moment for me was recognizing that chaos is created both internally and externally and the interconnectedness of these systems. We have choices as traders and the good work that you're doing, Ken, is helping us to deal with all this chaos in the world and actually turn it into opportunity. Um, <clears throat> one of my biggest analogies for chaos is the piles of sand where you keep dripping sand onto a pile until something gives. And, um, you know, the world we live in is so interconnected now that there seems to be a balance here, but the truth is we have to be prepared for things to go completely chaotic at every moment. And the two best ways to deal with this, in my mind, with respect to trading are one, stop trading, close your positions, get the hell out and wait until two, you are in an absolute zero state where you're looking at the market effectively. Um, and for me, that's quite important because I have a history of breaking my own rules when my ego and my emotions take over. And just being able to stop, sit on the sidelines and watch for a bit um, is a skill that took me, I think it was perhaps the, the most difficult skill in all of trading for me. So thank you for that. Um, and I will say that last night I made a visit to a behavioral health uh, unit of a hospital in Daytona and Getting in there was sort of a top security thing because a lot of these people are threats to themselves and others. And just looking around the room, th these were people that had internal chatter going on and they just had not been able to find their zero state. Uh, I wanted to be able to say something magical to help them, but there really was nothing for me. And unfortunately it's lithium and other things that will help these people stabilize. Uh, and that's one of the few areas where I am definitely in favor of pharmaceuticals to, uh, to make a change. But the point of it was for me was that all of these people had the same choices we do. And that is to neutralize, go to a zero state, reset ourselves and come back in. Uh, and on the bigger picture for me, that's why I'm redoing the foundations material uh, to reset myself. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys are all open to that and hearing me out. Uh -oh.
Chun Long. Hi, good morning. Um, my word of last week is focus. Um, what that word do to me, you know, it doesn't mean I don't do anything else. I do a lot of things. But that word work in a in the back side of my brain just give me a lot of new idea for my work in progress. That's a really amazing thing I found out. Especially when I do the exercise of working outside, that suddenly some new idea pop out. You know, I remember that. Get back to my uh, work in progress on um, your know, workout. It really very well. Uh, so last week I continue work on my spreadsheet and uh, try try to build up my ETF database. What I did is uh, you know. Uh, put my ETF database into categories, uh, for example, fixed income, commodity, currency, and those ETF trade on the uh, Toronto exchange. Uh, that, you know, take most of the time. Now I didn't expect to, you know, if, if I, I really dive into the ETF, found out what the ETF trade, uh, what the structure of the ETF, you know, what kind of uh, comparison to other ETFs. Uh, you know, a surprise to me is a new finding. So a couple of years ago, I learned a trading strategy. You know, basically you buy a dividend stock at a really low price, then you sell the call option not only receive the dividend also receive the um, premium i learned that i like that because i haven't treated that because that's a opportunistic trading system you don't buy the uh, stocks at the highest you know price you just wait to kind of a bottom and uh, buy that stock receive dividend and then sell the call premium, you know, increase the uh, dividend. What I found out uh, last week, there's a ETF exactly doing that for me. So I don't need to screen the stocks. I don't need to make uh, all those uh, options, uh, assessment and say, is that a good time? What kind of delta? I need to sell. So that's a surprise for me. So I will keep eyes on that ETF, still waiting for a good time, jump on to that ETF and that, that ETF go. That's my surprise for last week. So next thing I did last week, you know, I almost done my spreadsheet and the database. What do I do next? So that's a big shock to me. I feel, you know, I don't know what to do, but uh, I don't feel good about that feeling. So I said, you know, I have to take a trip, no matter what. Otherwise, I don't, I stay here, uh, look at my ET, my spreadsheet, look at all those data I give to me, present to me. I don't know what to do. So I decided just take a trade. So I take two trades. One trade stopped me out at the same day. The other trade is still in. So my theory is that is a good low risk idea for the ETF. If you stop me out, I'm out. I'm okay. I'm happy. But if you let me stay in, I will write that trade you know for maybe weeks months i think that's the idea for the you know etf2 and the bmr as the hybrid trading uh, i like that trade um so next week i will continue work on that process uh i apply can's plan prepare execution assessment you know, I continue to assess my 
spreadsheet. How do I do that? I compare my my result with Ken's daily report, weekly report. If I found something different, I better you know open the chart, understand why Ken see that's a doji, and my spreadsheet didn't give me a single doji, or the reverse. My spreadsheet say that's a workshop pattern. No, Ken's spreadsheet, Ken's report didn't say that's a workshop. I better to find out why. That's the way I learned, you know, there's a difference. You know, either, you know, my understanding of the rule is wrong, or either my calculation is wrong, or something else is wrong, or maybe something else going on. Uh, that's what I try to do next week, just to figure, uh, assess my spreadsheet, prepare a, prepare a um, PowerPoint present into the uh, uh, CANS uh, weekend research uh, project. Uh, that's my plan for next week, I uh hope. -huh. Share a screen real quick here. <clears throat> Let me know when you guys can see that. Looks like a blob. Yeah, so uh, eight weeks ago, I had open heart surgery to replace the, the aortic valve. Uh, surgery went very well. I'm recovering nicely faster than they've seen folks normally recover. Awesome. Um, still more work to go. Uh, I went into that whole process uh, determined to come out of it with um, uh, whole life improvement. And I started designing a process that felt right according to my gut and heart that would take me through the whole experience from really the moment I woke up after the heart attack to the testing, the consultation, the pre-op, the surgery, the ICU recovery, then the cardiac ward recovery, and now through the rehab. So I put together a process. I'm very satisfied with what happened, um, and I'm staying with the plan that came out of it. So I made a sketch in the first week uh, of that whole process, you know, when I got home, uh, to describe and re in an artifact uh, what that process was. And I was also multitasking. I was trying a new drawing program on my little sketch pad. And so I scribbled this out in about a minute and then gave about a 15 or 20 minute lecture on the steps that I followed to go through it. Uh, decided that I'm going to write a paper on this because I promised my surgeon and my mentor, David Boji, that I was going to write up what it was that I did so that they could have an artifact of what I was doing. The surgeon was interested because he said he had never seen anybody as serene as me, nor someone who decided what to do as quickly as I did. I think our consultation lasted two minutes about what surgery to have and what form of replacement valve to use. Uh, and then to decide to go that following Monday at the first opportunity. 
and that took less than two minutes for us to, from the time he walked in the door till we had that decision in hand. Um, so he was interested in what I was doing. We had some long talks, person to person later. Uh, and then I wanted to describe the process that I followed. So I put together this little, it looks like a dog's breakfast. It's very hard to read. Uh, my work in progress this week was uh, I'm starting to w working on putting the process of this um, impressionistic painting into a formal paper presentation. As part of that, I last night I put together this, which has the same information as the other diagram, but is now more of a structured approach. Uh, for example, this one specifies in detail um, let's see if I can find my there he is. I called it the uh, life audit theater process. It incorporates uh, three different processes the the vision quest of my spirit guide, I guess, Blood Brother, he's a Lakota Sioux medicine man, who gave me four words to work on. Uh, met him in a true story circle that I was hosting uh, for Professor Boji, and, and we've just stayed in touch every week. So I was incorporating the elements of his vision quest uh, I was incorporating elements of the um, NICAN in introspection process, which is a uh, process used by Zen practitioners in Japan to work on personal relationships. It's based on three different questions that you ask over the course of a week in a small room with on a, sitting on a mat with a journal and nothing else. You just focus on answering those three questions about people in your life. What has that person given you? What have you given that person? What problems have you caused? And then the true storytelling process that we're in right now from David Boji, which emphasizes the safety, trust, truth, and opportunity, the creation of artifacts in order to have something to reflect on, but also to put on the ground as a marker uh, for that event which happened at that moment. And then the seven principles of true storytelling. Well, so I wanted to incorporate all three of those things. It was my process that I was designing was concerned with these intentions and val I wanted my process to feature these things. Apparently serenity was really important because I had it on there twice. But those were the things that shaped the, the process I came up with that was personalized. The conditions were that from the time I went into pre-op till the time that I got home, those seven days, eight days, no phones, no TV or radio or any media, no visitors except my wife and daughter, no books, no computer. I could make notes handwritten. I could make sketches. And I was going to visualize and remember everything. And I was going to really concentrate on relaxing. And I was going to trust in whatever guide came up to my assistance. And that the scribe was going to record everything. And I could remember it. And so essentially, I had a casting call where I said I wanted not just the people in my life, but places, things, events, voices, and documents. It was like a casting call. Went out to the world and I said, please show up from my past, present, and future and sit in the audience in this big theater. And then one at a time, in an order that makes sense, come up on the stage and interact with me and help me understand the answers to these questions as and this was going to be a safe space 
and that my sky my observer and scribe were going to record that into an artifact and that was going to go up on this great big display screen behind the stage something like past present and future close middle and far whatever that means in terms of time and space and that as I created artifacts these were going to get posted on this infinitely large screen and I was going to post that artifact and I was also going to reflect on the connections um, between these stories and I was going to look for themes that might emerge and this tapestry this was going to be unintentional in the sense of not pre-designed but really as this thing would get crafted into an artifact it would go into a place that made sense and I would look at some point when I was not doing one of these things I was up here reflecting on the thing so and I was going to trust the director guide and mentor and coordinator to spend time between the growing tapestry of my life and then the intense exchange on the stage in front of all of these elements of my life that had showed up for me and sometime and it might take this person two or three times on stage to uncover you know progressively everything that was that needed to be said and i was going to let each member of this studio audience not only witness but also and hear but also take as much time as you needed to get on the stage and talk and i was just i noticed as i was doing this whole thing that there was part of me on the stage being the actor listening to and engaging with whatever the current thing was but also all these other elements were showing up and I was accepting I was surrendering to the process and trying to make sure that I had completely emptied my bowl so that nothing was left and that once all this was done I didn't have to do anything with it just the fact of doing it and completely emptying my bowl was enough and I was just committed to sitting in that circle of nothing else until it was time to do something else in which I was going to do that with an intention of love but that nothing was required of me other than just to do this thing to completion which I got from Mike Three Bears my spirit guide so this is what the new form of this thing now looks like. It's going to help me write about this in a more structured way in the paper that I'm going to present. But I was also just interested in noticing, you know, the difference on this tapestry of my life, this form of the story that I'm telling you now, and the other artifact, which look like that it's the same content but the story you never tell it the same way twice you never step in the same river twice so there's sort of that dynamic which captures this how the stories of our life iterate and infor they, it inform, this story informs that next time you tell it. And that the people in the circle with you are part of that shaping. And who you are as a person who's changed over time based on the path you've taken and the reflections you've had. That, that's sort of what this process of living in a true story style is like. You have these moments in these circles where you are resting, recovering, reframing, relating, restorying, reconning, rehabilitating, all those R words that happen inside this story circle with others. And that when the time 
to do something else, it becomes clear it's time to do something, and you just trust the direction you go in as guided in that moment by whatever it is that's driving you as driven by your intention towards some set of values. So anyway, this whole living story process is what that infinite screen was like for me. And uh, as I think about that, you know, um, I had my heart attack on a Monday, did testing and then consulting with the surgeon on a Wednesday. We decided here that we would have the surgery on Monday. I had pre-op on Friday. I started fasting. I was offloading everything in my life to com be completely free to experience the surgery and this process. Uh, that from the pre-op to the surgery, I was engaged in designing this process and deciding how I was going to do it while I was fasting. When I came going into the surgery, I had this all in mind and what I was going to do if I woke up from the surgery. And then I woke up from the surgery and then from this moment forward, until about noon on Friday, I was engaged in this thing called the Life Audit Theater, I'm calling it. Friday morning at about 2.30, I was absolutely wide awake and clear, and that I felt great confidence that I had done what I proposed to do correctly, and that it was time to work on the future part of this, and it was a deciding what intentions to go forward and what goals and objectives and what pathways and projects and whatever to decide what I was going to do in priority sort of you know that transition to the next steps and that was really preparing for the departure of you know from the true story circle that I had been in and I was content that whoever had showed up people, places, things, events, voices, cared enough to show up, were important enough to show up, that I was satisfied that I engaged with it each as truthfully as I could, and that I had documented as much as I could and remembered it, and that that was going to shape what was important to me as I'm living my life going forward. And so this is part of that living story process is just to report on the work in progress. This is the current form of this artifact. So I shared it um, last night with Mike Three Bears, who is my, uh, look, my friend, my Lakota Sioux medicine man, and shared it with David Boji, my true storytelling mentor, and uh, my inner guide who's concerned with these things, you know, the people side of this. These other, what I added to the NICAN was that each of these became an actor and I treated them as if they had a voice and they were part of the living process of energy. So Mike Three Bears typically sent me one sentence of insight. He said, humbly in his opinion, that I should think about And realize that there's a lot of words on this page and that that it may be time for me to get deeper directly into my body where mind and heart intersect so that I can not think that I'm done just because I've listed words on a page but that I really need to check in and fully integrate at the body and cellular level. And so for me, and I'll talk about it in my article and whatnot, that the, um, uh, the artifacts that are, that for me come out of this true story circle, I create the artifacts so that I can be free and empty and embodied when I leave knowing that that artifact is there 
testifying as best I could to whatever happened in here. And that I can, wherever it's time to, you know, tell a story or come back, that artifact is its own thing and it can be part of this process, but I'm really free to walk the road, to walk the path, having externalized all that into the artifact as best I could and leaving that as a whatever work of art which is the starting root of artifact it's a combination of art plus I who was there at the part creation of it and it was as factual truthful as I could make it so there even the word ends up having some kind of hidden mysterious power just the shape of the word itself like I gotta reflect on that have I really lived up have I been as artful as I can be was it driven by me and am I taking responsibility for only my story and was I as truthful as I could be now that frees me to think about that in the next time I get into a circle so that's where the that's where the telling of this story, of this experience, is. It was the lived experience, for sure. It's stuck in my memory. The recording about one week in, which featured that sketch, happened. And now, eight weeks later, the, I've told that story in this way, in another true story circle with a different artifact, but referring to the artifact that came out of this one. And so both my memory of that and the artifact itself and the journey and where I am now with the intention of in about another eight weeks, having the paper and the presentation at that next conference and all along the way thinking about what Mike Three Bears is saying of don't think that all the words that are associated with this is everything that there is. There's also what is embodied with mind and heart and body, which tied together by spirit, which is where he lives, fully in the spirit all the time, which I'm trying to experience and discover my own way by listening carefully to what he tells me and reflecting on it um, and trying to live that forward you know with the support and love that he gives me as part of that body of knowledge my testifying and testimony and all that is part of this body of knowledge and the NICAN process of understanding or living again and reflecting on the relationships between me and other people to re remind myself that of the obligations to the tribe and the people around me so that for me is why those three bodies of knowledge became very important to include in this process um, which went from literally age 66 on the last day of my soccer summer camp after scrimmaging with those kids having a heart attack on the field and having to be medevac. That was a uh, significant emotional event. And now I realize, yeah, I am exactly eight weeks forward from that whole event happening and the central organizing principle of my conscious intentional living is being driven and guided by this systematic process that I felt was correct for me at this time at that that's who I was exactly at that time and living forward this was my response to that event and this is where I am now in this true story circle uh, telling you what it was like where I am and where I am going forward as truthfully as I can 
uh, Aho. All right, so this is the moment where we, I'm going to hit the tones again, and I invite you to listen deeply, to empty your bowl, surrender to the moment, listen deeply for the words that rises to the top of your awareness, having just heard what we've heard and lived what we've just lived, uh, I submit that there's an inner voice that's ready to talk to you. And it may say some words for you to consider, or it may give you a word, or it may just be in silence. Whatever it is, it's exactly what you need to hear. So I invite you to empty your bowl and listen for the word that comes bubbling up as I hit the tones. And then I'll go around the room in the order I see you. I'll ask, I'll call your name, and you just give us the word, and I'll hit a tone to acknowledge it. And then we will hit the tones again and move into coffee talk. So that's where we are right now, including our guests. You are invited uh, to play along. And if and if all you want to do is pass, you just say pass when it's when I call your name. Whatever you do will be exactly correct. And again, we won't judge you because we've been in that position too. So listen in deeply. Chin Long. Acceptance. Damien. Witty. Joe. Adaptability. Greg. Enough. Mark. Adapt. Artifact. All right, this, I'll hit the tones one more time. That'll move us into the foyer for coffee talk in which we can talk about anything we want to talk about and then um, we're also free to leave with just a bon voyage, bon voyage uh, whenever the spirit moves you there no harm no foul just uh, um, it goes coffee talk can go as long as it needs to uh, or till the next thing happens so this moves us into coffee talk I'll just get started and just say the um, the experience we have in true story circles is sort of the, once you leave the true story circle and you know we kind of take on our life again you know that's where we do the things a hey, we talk to each other we coordinate we make judgments we ask questions we you know give advice receive advice when asked 
from our perspective, the true story experience sort of reinforces forever, though, that whenever you're doing that, you always become mindful that it's always exactly from your point of view. It's only from your point of view. It reminds us about the the power of the judgments we make, but also the limitations of living in a single perspective. And so it tends to um, change the way we ask for advice, what we do with it, and how we give it. Like, you, you can never lose sight of the fact that I, I can only tell you what it is from what I know and what I've lived. And then maybe the best way I can give it advice is to tell you a story about this situation that we're in and what happened as truthfully as I can. Sometimes you say, hey, I'm going to be directive here and say, from my point of view, this is the insight that I felt and maybe where it comes. But it, it, there's a subtle change I've seen in myself and in others who have reported on it. But what happens to how we engage with others outside of the circle? There's a carryover, a spillover. I know that it's made me a better... Uh, coach, father, husband, teammate, teacher, trader, because of that deeper sensibility of the social network that we live in and my place in it. And I become much more aware of all of those different roles. You know, when I hear myself speaking as a, which role am I playing when I say that thing in a certain way? What was the drive? Have I really thought my way through that? So it's, uh, that, that's the, um, the phenomenology of living in a true story circle is that it starts affecting you in those ways. Um, you, you remember that you really don't know all that much about whatever weight the other guy's carrying. Because inevitably, when those stories come in, you just get so amazed and you, you just, you never would have guessed that that's what they were going to talk about or that's where it went. And you realize that we really only see the surface of ourselves. And it, and as you discover your own depths that you didn't know, you say, God, you know, here, it, here it was, I, in my naivete, I thought I actually knew something about this other person. I know some things, but have I really, you know, connected at the deep level? And that's, that's where I think Mike is guiding me to think about the spirit knowledge, living in the spirit of body, mind, and heart, and not in the word world, but also in the direct world of spirit. So I got to think more about that and spend time in the you know, in the uh, true story circle, just emptying my bowl of words and reflecting on the fire that's in there, you know, in the little fire pit. Tending the fire is the, comes out of the Lakota tradition, the spirit guy that you trust to protect you while you're going through it is the fire tender, the one who cares for the fire that protects you from wild animals, gives you heat, while you're doing that inner work and outer work that the fire they're tending the fire so that you don't have to uh, and that's kind of the role Mike has voluntarily accepted and that I gratefully receive so that's what I want to say about that I hope so that's the transition into the coffee talk that so we can ask questions we can talk about things that we wouldn't talk about in the circle. Like, uh, I would have, I, you know, I, I felt really, some part of me really wanted to ask Joe if he was familiar with John Malden's essay on the paradox of the heap. He probably, if, a, if you're, you're a money guy, you know John Malden. And you may have come across that essay, which was, I think, the best one he ever wrote. Uh, I've read it five times. Yeah. I, I read it every year. He's really good. And, and that, 
I was aware of the paradox of the heat before he wrote about it. I thought he did a beautiful job connecting it to the world of finance. And in many ways, my ideas on a compound critical state addresses the paradox of the heap. And the paradox of the heap for our general is a, as you drop snowflakes on a mountainside, at some point, the next snowflake triggers the avalanche. But no amount of studying the mountain from a distance allows you to say, ah, the next one is the one that causes the avalanche. And yet avalanches occur. Well, it's the essential unpredictability, which is what Taleb gets to in his idea of the fourth quadrant problem, that these fat tail events happen and no amount of your statistics will give you complete confidence to predict when and where and how and how big. And that it's the illusion of control is the fourth quadrant problem. Well, I also would say, though, is there's an intermediate position which says you can study snowfall on mountainsides and seasons, and you can say, well, here's when avalanches occur. It turns out that on this mountainside with no snow, there's not going to be an avalanche. Now, there might be a rock slide, but that's an avalanche of a completely separate character because it has to do with earth and dirt, not snow on the mountains. So anyway, so I wanted to talk to you about that. I, I felt an urge to, but because I was in the true story circle, that's one I wanted to talk with you about later just to confirm. I had the suspicion that you knew of it because of the way you said the phrase. Without saying it, I sort of knew that you'd read that. You know, and I wanted to ask Chun Long Lee what the, what's the symbol of the ETF that he's tracking so that I can study that too, so I can see what what do the critical states of that ETF look like? In other words, when do people who are aware of that strategy suddenly start buying it? What triggers them to do that and what does that do after it gets in a critical state? Is that a tradable event? In the same way that I study all T ETF. So I wanted to ask you what that symbol was. Yeah, I'll send you later because I cannot uh... Yeah, fair enough. Remember that uh, that's a full ledger. I think it's yeah. GEPQ, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll so let, you when, you, when you get a chance, let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things that you end up having to do, and this is my final, final comment, is that in order to listen deeply in the true story circle, you have to actually create a persona inside yourself who is the perfect scribe and you say look at I know that there's a part of me that is always going to remember everything that was ever said and which I felt in that moment and that I can retrieve that later so I don't have to worry about it I can release that and simply exist in the listening of the truth so it kind of goes to that big list of things to process later and that I'm just going to invest that scribe in doing that and trust that that happens in order to quiet my mind, in order to be a deep listener. So it turns out that deep listening is even more fundamental to the truth telling. That there were six of us in the room, five of us were engaged in deep listening, one of us was trying to tell the best story truthfully that we could, you might think that true storytelling is the essential thing. It turns out it's the true story listening that matters in terms of the multiplication of truth in the world. So anyway, I hope. And that is officially the last thing I'm going to say. I wanted to... And I just uh, I... talked into the uh, chat as the ETF is JEPQ. JEPQ. Got it. Now, see, he was good enough. See, because I didn't interrupt him to ask him what it was while he was telling his story, that gave the story time to breathe. And I've already violated my not talking anymore, but aho.
But I, I, I have a challenge, Ken, and maybe it's out of the scope of today, and you can address it at another time. Um, the first one is finding creativity when you have very little of it. That's number one. And the number two thing is how do you get out of the uh, of the rut, if I can call it that way, that you're in, to be able to reinvent yourself? Well, the first thing you do is you dig the rut with your shovel by doing the work, by going through those little brief experiential learning exercises, okay. sur surrendering to the process, emptying your bowl, and then seeing what comes in instead of trying to force it and predict it and plan it and demand it, you in simply invite it. And the way that those creative impulses know that you're serious is because they witness that you've done all the prep work, which is you picked up your shovel, you went to the space, you surrendered to the moment, you emptied your bowl and you've invited it into your bowl and you patiently wait to see what arrives, if anything and you accept whatever the results are that time and it's good enough and complete and nothing else has to happen a hundred percent of the time that people do that they increase their creativity we measured that at the command and general staff college after a single two-hour lesson of doing this the guys were measurably more creative to a scientific Western standard fact uh, and a hundred percent of the people that go through this process so far have eventually just noticed like god dang I didn't even realize it or know it or measure it I could just when I do actually reflect on it it just happens and what it is doing according to Fletcher is it is connecting it is bypassing that rational brain of yours with the words and the concepts that has to know ahead of time the right answer so that you can give the right answer and pass the test it, it's bypassing that and connecting to your biochemical brain which inherited through DNA the capacity to use stories and words in these processes to experience directly altered states of consciousness and to generate creative impulses that led to the survival of the species. It's remembering our DNA. That's what's going on. And at some point, you have to live it in the same way that Mike Three Bear says, I need to spend time setting down setting aside the words and connecting directly to the fire with my body to integrate with mind and heart living in the spirit of that fire which you are already sensing by saying that you were unserious so far i think you were serious and were doing the work within your capacity and the fact that you're still here tells me that that's true but now where you are is maybe are you judging to say that wasn't enough or you're saying that same level of effort is not enough for where you are now and you can say that without by forgiving your earlier self let that guy be who he was he was brave enough to try it so let it be what it was just accept that and commit going forward to whatever level of energy you put into it is what you decided it was going to be and whatever that was was right for you with no judgment from anybody else because only you can make that call and whatever it is is going to be right that's what I'd say no, well said part, part of it is also I, I believe is uh, you were reminding yourself that you have standards that are way up there and uh, you're just reminding yourself that it's time to 
start working with them. Yeah. Everything you say or don't say, either the noise you make or the silence that you emit, goes out to the edges of the universe for all time and space, the conservation of story, the conservation of energy. So there's a connection between you and what you just did or didn't do to everything else. My hypothesis is that when we state an intention to have a true story circle, the commitment to do that as best we could, the universe hears that and the universal ear is listening for the sound of the truth so that it can experience its own truth through the stories that we tell from the point of view that we're in, that the universe has invested in us to be that single point of view that is uniquely us, that is perfect in that universe, that little singularity that we are, is perfect because we are exactly what it is and nothing else. No other point in the universe actually represents exactly that point of view. And so the story that comes out of that can only be truthful. And we have more or less skill, we think, in trying to tell it. But whatever it is that we did, it's like the drum. When you play a drum, you can't play it wrong. You can only play it the way you played it. And whatever it was, was exactly what you did. And it was perfect in that moment for, you know, to document that is an artifact for what what you were and who you were in that moment, which is why live music has such a quality to it that the best recording can never replicate what it meant to be in that space. Because we only hear the music. We're not seeing the people and all and how we were facing, et cetera. Aho. Uh -huh. As a bystander, um, what you guys are doing is something um, very important. Uh, when you guys, when you gave the introduction and you started talking about this course specifically, there was a vibe, a seriousness, in the sense where anyone can joke, yeah, but there is this vibe of seriousness where you can feel that there's something important about to take place and and you don't feel that quite often unless there's something happening between yeah. some sort of acceptance and some sort of alignment some sort of acknowledgement between a group of people and to what's about to take place what's about to happen yeah, I think it speaks to our, you know, living in the spirit in public with others, that there are moments, and then there are moments with a capital M, that we get a sensing at the primal level that something special, a critical state, if you will, where there's more clarity or purity or significance because of the coming together of different forces or conditions or whatever and you know we have those a lot sometimes they'll sneak up on you other times they happen because you see them coming from a long way you know the moment of graduation from a school um i can remember going to summer retreats at monasteries run by uh, monks and we would meet and whatever would go through the you know, uh, music and prayers and sports and food and fellowship and talking and silence. And uh, the, the last time that I went to that, when I was, you know, at this, at the age when it was that, it, it was for kids of a certain age. And I knew that was the last time I was ever going to go to there. That really struck me in that moment that not it, not only was it special it was really special because it was you know the closing of one door and the opening of another and so you know those the sacredness of each moment 
is probably always there. And then we are either tuned into it or not. And I just think that folks that are really spiritual have sort of uh, moved to that place where all those doors are immediately available and they're always close to that opening into the what the what somebody would call the samadhi or the you know the magic moment in Hindu. Or, um, yeah, so yeah, that's we we use that the tone sort of as a reminder of that, and then when we tell our story and we say aho, which is Lakota for Lakota Sioux language for as it should be, or another way of saying. Amen. So be it. Uh, as it was said, so let it be written. That the tone gives it 10 seconds for that thing to get out into the world. And it's free. Okay, it's free. We, we let the little baby deer get up and run. And we've, we've given it time to just be what it was. 10 seconds to just witness the birth of that story the way it was. Never to be told the same way again finished and moving on that's 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 what those little tones do and when we added that to the to the method to the practice it really took on a significance we noticed um, we tried sitting in silence for 10 seconds and that was pretty good but the tone acted almost like a mantra to because it allowed you to connect to all the other times that you successfully sat in silence and it had a reinforcing quality to it. And we realized that in between the tones there was a lot of silence. Like when I talk, stop talking, there's silence, which is a good thing. So, aho. <laughs> yeah, in a way, it's like a classical tradition. So the tone becomes like a moment of surrounding, just yeah. appreciate knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, each cycle of tones is one trip up the mountain and back down. You're back at the same spot, but you're a different person than the one who started up the mountain. Each cycle deepens that awareness and ex exposure. It's been my experience. And I do recall some of the work at Vans where we used heuristics to try to put ourselves into a certain mental state um, and I'll also add that this discussion has reminded me of one of the most useful things I learned from Van, and that was that our belief systems are acquired in given situations throughout our life, and they're very useful at the moment, but they need to be reconsidered and modified and potentially shelved at other points in our life, otherwise they become a drag on us. So for me, the tones that I sometimes go off in my head during the day are just a reset to look at myself and see what's going. And the way that Libby put it was just to ask ourselves continuously, what else could it be? And when I first started doing that, I wasn't getting many answers, but as time went on, every time I asked the question, I got a different answer. What else could it be? So. Um, yeah, yeah, for me today. That connects to Damien Damien's question about what's the procedure? It's, it's sort of doing the work and the repetitions and the habits and norms. What was once exceptional becomes normal, and it changes the way you look at things. Um, in many ways, that life audit theater I described was a r really large scale, you know, seven day process of cleaning up the temple of self, you know, and trying to, you know, be, make it more presentable and, and just do the work that needed to be done that had been neglected maybe, or just periodically, you know, and, and I knew when it was done at two thirty in the morning on that Friday, when I sort of woke up absolutely clear, no, no brain fog from medication. And I knew I was ready to go home and I had four hours before the, they were going to come and get me. And that was when I shifted into the so what, the action plan going forward. What were the priorities? And that's when I drafted out the 
the 10 books I was going to write and the uh, workshops I was going to complete and um, things I was going to do for the soccer club and what I was going to do on my terms teaching for the army, how I was going to shape that and what I was going to do in my family and with personal relationships and kind of resetting all those um, the, the quality of those relationships. So yeah, that was that at a grant sort of a grand scale for me. That was the that reset and refresh was key. Uh -huh. I, I'm a bit curious with uh, Joe. Um, he, you came about uh, the same word I was about. I was thinking about the word adapt. Um, and in my mind, um, when you guys were speaking, I I was trying to remember what attracts me to trading. And the best answer I could come up with so far um, is that the fact that the similarity between trading and uh, real life in terms of surviving. So not knowing what would happen next, surprise, adapt, and move on as fast as we can. So this is, this is how the story is in my head that actually allowed me to reach that word to adapt. And uh, I, by coincidence, or maybe not so much, since we're in a very tight circle, uh, you came about also the same word, which is uh, adaptability. And with respect to both the market and the rest of life, it had uh, popped into my head as, as the best word to encompass, I guess, what I was thinking throughout this uh, session. So I think you and I were sort of on the same track. I may have been beyond just the markets here. And that's why the human race is, is dominant, among other things, is our adaptability. And we're going to have to learn to adapt to deal with whatever's coming down the road here. Perfect. Yeah, that is so true. But I'm going to leave you guys. I have family calling, Yuri's calling, caught lunch. Yep. Take so good care. We will see you all next week. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. The, uh, the adaptability reminds me, you know, Robert Gardner, you say, uh, you don't have to be right. You just can't stay wrong too long. So that whole iterative embracing of the uncertainty and following the voice of the market. I, I, that's why I, I think the uh, for me the educational model and frame of reference for trading is so powerful. Not only are we trying to learn how to trade from others, the nature of trading itself is we're trying to learn from the market what's working, what it wants to reward. It's rewarding certain behaviors. Uh, and that changes. As people change to its lesson, it teaches a different lesson. So there is a, it is a healthy perspective to have a teacher-student relationship with the market. That uh, I, as the student, am trying to learn what the market is teaching me through the voice of price, which has volatility, and duration and range. And so those direct measurements of that is how the market is speaking about what it is at that moment. And at the same time, when I'm acting in a certain way, I'm teaching it what I think. And it's responding to that with results too. So there is a, that learning relationship uh, is a key to survival because you, it's always got more to teach you. So you don't think you actually understand that whole thing. It's it's learning. It's a it's the universe is large and every little part of it is changing and we're only seeing it from one point of view. So it's got stuff it's working on that we haven't seen yet. So that keeps you humble and uh, careful. Cautious but not overly so. Um and allows you to think about your circle of competence and, and all that stuff too. So uh, that's why you see me spending time in the theory and practice of learning, 
adult learning theory and the biology of that, the psychology of learning, in addition to trading, because I think there's a, there's a, that works on a number of different levels. I, I would just share this other story too, that uh, I was chairing, I was the host for uh, a three year long story circle that had Mike Three Bears in it, my Lakota Sioux guy. And what we did was we had a word for the week that we were going to think about for the week ahead. And all of us using the same word. And then we would come to the circle and tell a deep, truthful, personal story that illustrated what we thought that word meant for us at some emotional moment in our life. Like the word love or duty or responsibility. And so we would think all week, I'd come up with a short a two minute story that encapsulated some moment in my own life where that really came to. So you would think about it all week and then you come in and you really thought you knew what that word meant. And then you come in and there'd be 10 people in there, each with a powerful personal story about the word duty. And so you would tell your story, aho, and your bowl is empty because it was all in that story and you really and you're ready to listen. And then nine other stories about what duty means. And you would say, oh my God, I thought I knew something about what the word duty meant until I see all of these other manifestations of it. And then it would surprise you and say, oh, that actually triggers a memory that I hadn't even remembered during that week. But now it's like, oh yeah, that. Or I never even thought of it that way. And you realize that the experiences of our lives are deep and rich and infinite. And we try to collect them into these words that have taken on a certain meaning for us. And sometimes they have multiple meanings. And then we think we know something because of the way that we told that. But it turns out that these power words, if you will, these themes uh, connect all of these different parts of our stories of life, which is how we remember and which is how we decide. And they were always embodied in a certain place and time. And yet it carries forward into the future and shapes what we believe and what we think is possible or not possible. And then you realize that by gently twe tweaking those, you can restory and reimagine and revisit and live forward in a fresh way unencumbered by those entanglements if you choose to do so. What Libby gets to about, you know, the freedom to transform, uh, which Van talked about is, you know, transform yourself by changing your beliefs. Um, for me, that life audit process was about, life theater, was about sort of tracing those things in a formal, systematic way and having it on that living display. That really, that living story mosaic or tapestry for me really is a living story that every day as I reflect on it, it's this thing is, and I realize how much is changing and yet how much remains the same. You know, the underlying piece that is changeless and the thing that is always changing. The Jains talk about that. The yin yang talks about that. Um, that's the exciting part of these stories. So yeah, your your insight about the two words that came up coincidentally. Yeah, it's the coincidences. We just don't know what the connection was yet is my is my hypothesis. But um, what what we do on Saturday mornings is we re, we have a story circle where we just do works in progress. So we got away from the everybody thinking about the same word and what does it mean? And then tried story circles where it was whatever your work in progress on for yourself is, come in and tell us what's going on that's most important, which has a different flavor to it, but it's still a true story circle. And it's really kind of interesting um, in, in that sense. So the only thing we don't do on Saturdays is talk about trading because there's guys in there that are not traders, some that are, but uh, we, we want to somehow try to get beyond this madness which is trading thinking about trading all the time so so that's there's that kind of thing so anyway i'll hold to that 
And I got about 10 more minutes. I see my wife is uh, pointing at the clock. And hey guys, I think I'm we're going to do a goodbye. brunch. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Paul. So, and I'm going to, I'm going to hang this recording as an artifact, you know, in that course, just to say that's who we were and that's what we said. And that was, and that's all it had to be. It was, it was, you know, that perfect moment for 90 minutes or whatever that we shared. So I want to just thank you guys. Grateful for the opportunity to spend the time of our life together. And um, I forgive ourselves. We forgive ourselves for the stories we told and that we've lived and that we're going to just try our best to keep getting better. So take good care. And we'll, thank you. Thank you, Ken. We'll see you on down the road, fellas. Thank you very much.